What was the uh, name of the that philosophical movement where a lot of people started questioning how people should be treated what they deserved? Yeah, the Enlightenment. Nice. Okay. This was a while ago. I mean, this was maybe 1688 at best to about 1789. All right. Who was at the beginning of this that came up with the idea that uh, we should all be born with a certain set of uh, um, rights guaranteed us to us. John Locke. Yeah, it was John Locke. <laughs> and do you know the the uh, anybody know the, uh, the three rights that uh, he spe uh, specified? Was it life, liberty, and property? Yes, life, liberty, and property. And we're going to focus on the property because how did property work beforehand? Like who was the uh, who owned the land and, and assets and things that that you had? Yeah, the king, and, or maybe your lords. Could you close that door, please? Thank you. So the owners were not, uh, the private property didn't exist. You didn't own anything. You rented it uh, from uh, the monarch, whether it's king or queen, or the nobles. Uh, you didn't actually own anything. You can get your right the sheet. Here's like you need money for those answers. All right. So Davis, you had two, Peter had one. Nicholas had one. Did I miss anybody? I don't think so. Okay. Monarchs and nobles owned it, right? And uh, you rented it. How did it, how did I rent it, by the way? By farming. Farming. Okay. And then giving them the excess. Yeah, all the excess would go to them essentially, right? Uh, and then would go back to him. Cool. So that's how you would do it. So you weren't actually a uh, an individual person. You were part of a class, right? Uh, and what was this uh, class system called? This hierarchy. Ubalism. Right. Cool. And then can you give me the four that are on it? King at the top. Nobles. King. Nobles. Knights. Right. Cool. That's the feudal system. And it's not called this everywhere in the world. It's a little different, uh, prior to this time everywhere. But it's essentially the same. In fact, somebody said yesterday it's a caste system. Wherever I'm born, I'm stuck there. All right, and it doesn't doesn't matter how good or smart or motivated I am, uh, I am there, and that's where I am. All right, okay. Um, so, what was the 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 way property worked? Where if I take a noble, for example, and here's my chunk of land, and I live in my manor, um, all the peasants that are here, they can uh, walk around on the land, hunt on it, farm on it, whatever they want as long as they pay their rent. Uh, what is that called, by the way, where I'm, I actually can't leave this? I'm part of it, and I'm, I'm part of the property there. Uh, common land. Common land, exactly. All right. And the uh, problem with common land is I have no reason to try to farm better or harder because I don't even get to keep the uh, uh, spoils of my effort. It goes to somebody else. So, like, why would I bust my ass to find a new way to do things or make more food or, or, or whatever? Right. So this was a bad system uh, for incentivizing people. Okay, uh, how does the idea of private property, where um, it's not owned by the king and the nobles, but in fact my stuff is actually mine, um, how does that change things? Because now you actually have a reason to your stuff. You do, okay, so what I would want, because that was a really easy answer, do you remember where this started? What area in the world this started in? Was it England? England, yeah, is the ones that are really going to start this idea of uh, having private property protection. England is where this is going to begin. Cool. So England changes a couple things. Um, they changed the role of government. The role of government used to be to limit the people in it. So what is the role of the government now after this enlightenment? Uh, it's no longer to limit the people. What is what is the role now? Um, to protect our rights. Yeah, it's to protect our rights. So if anything, the government's limited. In fact, they limit it with a specific set of written rules. I mean, what those specific set of written rules is called that tells the government what it can and can't do. Constitution, right. We start getting constitutionalism. Constitution. Exactly. Which is a, a, a set of limitations for the government. I know this is a lot, and it kind of mixes in with government, which is what we'll talk about in, what, March when we switch over. Uh, but they're definitely interrelated. Okay. So they got rules and protections, uh, and now I'm actually uh, wanting to maybe uh, farm more food better, find better ways of doing things, because uh, I get to keep the profits for it. Okay, that's wonderful. So, what starts happening is uh, uh, nobles, whether they're lower or higher nobles, or other people that maybe just have opportunity money or land, they start uh, fencing this off. So, the two things I want to know is 
why would they fence it off besides the fact that it's private property now and what is this movement called so why are they fencing it off and what's the movement called yep yeah it's to protect the land from uh, other people and animals for the most part right and that's part of this uh, enclosure movement enclosure movement excellent all right so they fence it off and they also start kicking off some of these peasants so i want to know first of all why are they kicking some of these peasants off and what the hell are these peasants going to do um they're kicking the peasants off so that they could uh, so that they could actually pay them for what they like work for yeah exactly okay pay them they're like start, a wage mm -hmm. they're going to start going to the urban areas to go look for uh, urbanized exactly so the uh, reason why they, they are going to start paying them the reason why they're kicking them off is they want to use this land as efficiently as possible a bunch of people random people walking around using it or not using it or stomping on it or letting their animals run around I'm gonna have less uh, uh, farming production. So that's why I'm kicking them off. And yes, the ones that stay here, uh, they are, are gonna be paid laborers now instead of just renting. Okay, and then the rest uh, urbanize and go to the uh, cities. All right. How does this, because that sounds bad, and in fact it is bad like we talked about with cities because there's overcrowding and crime and there's no real structures. So they build their buildings too close together so there's a fire and your whole neighborhood goes up in flames. Um, that's not good, but how does this movement here actually benefit not just Europe and England, but the rest of the world eventually? Because they figured out like ways to like farm bigger. Okay. So it spreads like all the other places. Exactly, because they have incentive to try to make more. Yeah, okay, cool. Gotcha. So I have more food available for everybody. And when I have more available, what happens to the price of that food or anything? It it's going to go down, right? So now people have more access to food and they can buy more because it's cheaper. Right, that really, really changes the game. So here, uh, we're gonna have, uh, because of the innovation and, and the incentives, you're gonna have population growth, uh, but you're also gonna have an increase in the money supply, which is basically just the amount of money uh, people have, because they're earning it. Okay, cool. So these peasants uh, start figuring out, hey, uh, if I got money, thank you. If I got money, I can buy food, and in fact, I can now, for the first time, maybe buy enough food to not worry about dying the next week. All right. Um, what do they start doing to earn a little bit more money on their own time, whether they're still up here uh, at night on the, in the rural areas or, or uh, uh, in cities? They start making their own clothing and shoes. Exactly, So, because um, uh, they want to make some more money to buy more food or, and, and clothes and other things. What is that called? You remember what, when they're making their own clothes um, in um, uh, their homes at night? Do you remember what it's called? No. Okay, I'll still give you the money because you got the actual answer. I'll go, what's it called? Proto-industrialized. Yeah, there we go. And they, they also call it the putting out system, too, because they're they're getting the cloth from the companies, making it, and selling it back to them. Sweet. So that starts this whole uh, proto-industrialization process. So now people have more food and they have more clothes. Like, and food, shelter, clothes, and water. That's like the four things you need. Once you got that, extra money uh, can be spent on things that uh, you like. So better food or clothes or houses. Or, or other items inside your house or whatever. All right, so this is where people for the first time starting in this era in Europe, they're actually for the first time starting to transcend um, just the daily toils and suffering of life, uh, where now these things are easier to get so they can focus on doing other things that they enjoy, uh, that they're passionate about, uh, or that they uh, just like better, uh, better versions of it. Okay, cool. So that's where we'll pick up on the notes today um, with corporation. Which most people will tell you are evil. Um, and they might be sometimes, but uh, overall, they're a net benefit <coughs> to everybody. So you can start the next little page, just put a four title, uh, New Economic Institutions and Entities. So I think what I'll do is I'll explain the first two slides and then we'll take a break. All right. So it's a pretty good system because for the first time, uh, it doesn't matter as much. Well, it does matter because you know if you're born wealthy, then you have money and you can start things much more easily. But for the first time, uh, because of this idea, oh, I forgot to mention what John Locke's theory was that believe we were all the same and were uh, uh, not fixed 
into our social class we were born. But what was that called, by the way, when he believed that we were all born uh, and could become anything? Blank slate. Yeah, the blank slate. Exactly. And again, we don't know, we know that's not exactly correct because you do have instincts and evolutionary um, uh, factors that, and genes that help determine who you are. But certainly we don't know what your potential is. All right, and they did not trust people before. They did not trust people to make decisions on uh, how, the, how to make things or how to, um, how to price them, what the quality was. Uh, who did they trust to uh, make things and the quality and hire people and set prices? There were like two or three different things you could uh, identify here. Do you remember? The craft guild. The craft guilds in cities was the, the first one, right? And that was, of course, set by the city government. So they determined prices, employment, quality, etc. Who else was the only real people that were uh, trusted to make any decisions because they were born wiser uh, and gifted? King and uh, nobles. Exactly. Right. And then uh, you would say uh, the monarchy uh, and nobles. And they didn't trust you if you were uh, born of the soldier class or the peasant class or whatever. They believed you were stupider. And these guys were inherently wiser and therefore should make all the decisions. Okay. But we know. Uh, after the uh, whole blank slate idea, natural rights, that that's not the case. You actually do have potential. And uh, certain people are better at or smarter uh, at things than others. But we don't know when you're born what your potential is. So we should allow you uh, to figure out uh, what your potential is. OK, so here's a scenario. Private property begins in England. So one good idea would be possibly uh, to get some land, whether it's in England, in Europe, or it's in the New World, which they just started to discover. Uh, why would I want to get new land? If, I'm, if I want to become successful, why might it be a good idea for me to get my hands on some land? Preferably land that I can farm, obviously. Can you make a profit off it? Yeah, that's how you can make a profit and grow, and you can uh, get yourself the food, clothes, et cetera, you need, grow your family, and, and all of that, right? So the idea back then, because we don't have machines, electricity, and stuff like that yet, uh, the best way to get rich and successful back then was to get land and then cultivate it. All right, and maybe you got lucky too and there was like uh, gold or silver or copper mines or something on it uh, as well. So it's just like a bonus. So either you farm it or you mine something out of it. But that was the way to get money. So I need land. All right, uh, let's say I am born into a, a noble family as opposed to a uh, peasant family. Now in England anyway, I could get this land now. I'm not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not forbidden from making decisions and buying my own stuff. I can do it. But is there an advantage to be born in here as opposed to here if I want to get land? What is it? Money, Money yeah. It's easier for me to buy stuff, OK? Uh, and those are the first people that really uh, go out and get land and cultivate it are the, uh, the ones that can afford it. They would either afford, uh, so if we go from, well, I'll draw a map in a second. They were the ones that could afford to buy land or afford to send ships out to the New World uh, to try to find land for themselves. Uh, but these guys are limited themselves and only so much money they have to be able to do this. What about these guys? Do they have any real chance of going out and being able to afford this? No, the best they could be is like the uh, uh, ones that actually risk their lives that are being, uh, they're being paid to go to the New World and, and find the land. Uh, but they literally risk their lives and they leave their families if they have one uh, to go do that. So what people start devising is giving these people, and even these people, ones that have outstripped their ability to pay for things, or maybe they weren't as wealthy as some other nobles, they needed a chance to afford this land. So if I want to buy land now, whether it's a house or I want to start a business and, and get a factory or a shop or a warehouse, most people don't have like hundreds of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars laying around to go buy it, right? If you want to start a business or buy land, uh, you need something to purchase it with. How do we do it now? Because almost nobody, when they start these things, has the money to just pay for it. Loans. How the hell do you do it? Loans. Loans. Okay, cool. That's one option, and that's one we'll talk about today. So today we have loans. Um, and kind of like a form of loan uh, is, a, is, a, is a tactic that they developed. It's a very effective one. So this is not just for buying land, but it's also to fund uh, explorers to go to the New World, which they just discovered, uh, and get land there. This is what we call a joint stock company. And this is a wonderful idea. Uh, it's even more wonderful when they add the uh, corporate element to it, which I'll, I'll explain to you. First, we explain to you how this works. 
So if I've got like a bunch of uh, nobles and or peasants uh, or merchants and knights, whoever it might be, let's say to fund an expedition to the new world to get myself some land to grow food on or, or get gold or silver or whatever. Let's say it costs me $1 million to afford a crew, the ship, and the supplies. Who do you think um, uh, has a hundred million dollars just laying around? Maybe the king. Maybe the king but they usually don't either. They, just, they even have to borrow money, uh, this, this sort of a sum back then. All right, so let's just assume that almost nobody can just be like, here's a million dollars that if I lose it, oh well. Almost no one can do that. How can they, uh, how can they find a way to work together to get this million dollars? Well, let me rephrase it actually. If no one person could do it, could potentially maybe 20 people, 10 people get together and pool this money together and afford it? They could, okay. So let's say we do that. Let's say we get, that's what a joint stock company is. We get 10 people to agree, hey, uh, we'll just to make it, make it simple, we'll say they each have $100,000 that they have extra. If they lose it, uh, it sucks, but they're not gonna just die. Or maybe, maybe it would, maybe that's their only $100,000 and they're banking it on this, I don't know. But you got 10 people willing to risk the $100,000, all right? How could we do this evenly? Like if the ship comes back and they find gold and land and all that stuff, how can I make sure everybody's equally happy? So let's put, let's put up here. Here's the ship without any sales. It's a million dollars. There's 10 people. They each have $100,000. Well, what percentage of the voyage are they funding for each person? 10%, 10% right? There's 10 of them. And they have 10% of the voyage each. I didn't count this. I should probably count it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, it's not even, but that's 10. Right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There we go. Ten percent. So if the ship goes out, they find some land, they, they come back with some cool new stuff like tobacco or or uh, uh, they cultivate sugar over there or they find gold, silver, whatever it might be. They come back uh, and the uh, profits of their sales, whether it's the land or the goods, uh, is $3 million. How's everybody gonna get paid? 10% of all the profit. Exactly, so I take that profit, right? And uh, I guess the profit's technically two million, but they come back with three million total. So the way these things are set up, and they, they have contracts beforehand, and these 10 people get together, they sign a contract saying, uh, you're going to essentially get the same percentage back that you put in. So if I put in 10%, I get 10% back. All right, so what's 10% of 3 million? You may know. It's 300,000. Cool. So that would mean when the ship comes back, which it hopefully does, um, all these 10 people, if they're still alive, uh, they're each going to get uh, $300,000. Right? Hey, maybe you get lucky too and somebody did, did die and now you get to split nine ways instead of 10. Actually, it would, it would go to their family then. But, anyways, uh, that way you profit. All right, so this is gonna be the first way that they figure out how to either buy land or explore for land or goods, um, and they're able to pool money together fairly. All right, so whatever percentage I put in, I'm gonna get that back. So let's say I was particularly wealthy and I could afford to fund 50% of this bad boy by myself, half of it. Uh, then when it comes back, I would get 1.5 million. All right, that's how it would work. So what's the risk then? This just sounds like a wonderful way to just automatically make money. Where's the risk? Yeah, what if the ship doesn't come back? Is that a possibility? Hell yeah, back then it was definitely a possibility. In fact, it was routine. It was like almost half of ships wouldn't come back. So that's pretty risky. Okay, um, so they got even smarter about it. It's like, well, let's say I do have a million dollars uh, to invest in an expedition or in land. Is it a good idea to put all of my investment into one ship? No. no. What's the better idea? Spread it out into a bunch of different ships, exactly. So that actually makes it safer so let's say I fund, I split my million dollars into 10 different ships and four don't come back. It's like, well, I lost that money. It sucks for that crew because they're dead, most likely. Uh, but for me, I'm okay because six ships came back and I made a bunch of money, all right? And this is a, that's a joint stock company. And this is a, a wonderful way that they figure out legally how uh, to uh, purchase land, fund expeditions and things like that so you can go out and make money. You risk the money, obviously. Uh, but you actually get to, to profit directly from it. It's a little bit safer for everybody. All right, so this actually 
gives people incentive and some safety uh, to risk their money uh, in land or exploration and make money off of it. So it ends up being a, a wonderful uh, tool and mechanism. And like I, like I mentioned before, the important part here is these are legal contracts. So what happens if, I, if the ship comes back and I, one of the 10 people, try to take all three million myself? What's gonna happen? What? Get exactly. The, the government will punish me for that, right, if they can prove that I did it. It's not just like vigilante justice, like, oh, I'll get him, I think he did, and they go out and they kill me if they can find me. No, this is different. This is, the actual government will enforce this contract. They're like, no, 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 no. The terms state you get 10%, so if you take more than that, you know, we're, we're taking it back from you, you're going to jail, you know, what are the punishments going to be? So these are legally enforced, so that's a big deal. So this sounds like a good system, right? Pretty safe for people? It's not by itself though. There's one thing you're not thinking about. It's a term we had on our uh, jigsaw. It's called liability. You answered a question, I forgot to you money for that by the way. It's called liability, all right? Let's pretend the ship doesn't come back. All right, we, we all, all, all 10 of us go in and we fund this voyage and uh, the ship does not come back, all right? Are the family members of the crew we sent out gonna be happy about that? No, they're not, right? They're, their uh, husband or son, or because almost all the explorers are men, there's almost no females, but maybe there's a chick on there. But uh, whether they're men or, uh, or women and they don't come back, that family just lost a member of their family, uh, an asset, uh, somebody that could provide for them. Uh, they're not gonna be happy about that, all right? So here would be the risk of that. If I just go in on this agreement, all 10 of us, we're all vulnerable to being sued by the crew that had come back. Like maybe, maybe the ship we sent off wasn't inspected properly or wasn't safe and it crashed and uh, we're actually the reason why that crew died. It wasn't because of they made an error or, or something like that. Uh, if it comes back, we're all in trouble. And here's what I mean by that. So let's uh, take two out of these 10 people. One of them is a really rich guy. He's got a huge manor, a bunch of land. He's very, very wealthy. He's got like, I don't know, $5 million worth of stuff. So $100,000 to him, it's like, whatever. Not, not that big of a deal. Uh, it's not gonna hurt me too bad. What about though the peasant that barely scrounged up that $100,000 and that's all he's got, right? They both fund this mission, mission, right? But like I said, because we didn't inspect it properly, the ship sucked, whatever. It crashes, crew doesn't come back, they all die, and the families try to sue us. What's gonna happen to these guys? They're gonna lose money, right? Okay, cool, so the family's gonna come in. They're gonna sue us for this. So families uh, sue, right? Because you lost the mission, uh, and not, not like in a video game sense, like the mission like failed and people died, right? They didn't come back. So we want um, some compensation for that, all right? Well, if they're gonna go to sue this guy, does he have anything left to take? No. Nope, he's got nothing left to take because his $100,000 was in that ship. He's like, I, I'm, I'm sad too, man. I got nothing now. What about this guy though? They're gonna come right for him, right? And there's not, unless you protect yourself somehow, which is what we're gonna talk about, they can go after all of your stuff uh, to compensate for the loss of life, uh, the loss of time, for misleading them, for making a mistake. This guy could potentially lose everything because he's being sued by the families of the crew. And it's not guaranteed to lose all this $5 million stake, but he might. All right, and that's a very, very, very scary proposition. All right, so now if, now if you know that's a risk, who's more likely to uh, fund this voyage? The peasants. Yeah, the peasants, because they got nothing to lose. If I'm actually wealthy, I'm terrified that you're gonna find some way to sue me and I'll lose all my stuff. So what can we do to make sure that these guys, the ones that do the most of the investing, are not so terrified of uh, funding uh, land or expeditions? What could we do? maybe, that would make them more likely to uh, go through this. Because like, if this is the way it is, I ain't gonna do it. Like, There's a good chance that crew's not coming back. You're gonna assume I'm gonna lose all my stuff anyway. Not worth it. So that means things are not going to happen economically. I'm not gonna have expeditions. I'm not gonna buy land. How can we make that person safe? How can we make that guy feel better about investing? Because he can invest a bunch of ships. That's somebody we want uh, creating jobs and opportunities and things like that. How can we save them? Kind of, 
very close. This is where we add the ne next layer that uh, protects people from being sued personally. Uh, this is called a uh, legal corporation. All right, and these joint stock companies are usually, when they make the contracts, they form them as corporations. Here's what a corporation is, and this is still how corporations work, if you don't understand what they are. A corporation is a legal entity. Like, it doesn't actually exist, but it does exist legally. So if we go down to corporation, so these two guys get together, and they're like, all right, we're gonna form a corporation, we're gonna fund this expedition, and we'll call it, uh, what are we gonna call it? Badass Exploration Corporation. Bay Corp, I like it. All right, cool. Badass Exploration Corporation. Uh, not the Bay we know, but Bay for this one. Uh, Bay Corp, so they form a legal entity, all right? They put their money in, the $100,000, And this becomes the uh, entity that creates the mission, all right? So again, it is made up of these two guys, but it is separate from these two guys. That'll make more sense here in a second. So they put in their money, they fund this mission, and the same thing happens, all right? The crew dies, the family's like, screw you guys, we want compensation for this, we're gonna <coughs> sue you for our dead uh, family members, and they come after them. If I formed a corporation correctly, they can't sue me personally. They can only sue the company, all right? So this, this, this company here put in $200,000. That is the maximum they can sue that corporation for. They can't go beyond that. So they can't be like, oh, well, uh, we need more money in this. We're gonna go after your actual stuff that you own. They can't do that, all right? That's what a corporation does. It's called a veil, the corporate veil. It protects you from being sued directly. So if I throw my money into my business, could they sue my business and bankrupt it and make it not exist? Yes. Uh, but they cannot come after my stuff, all right? So let's say that happens. They sue uh, Baycor and uh, they get the $200,000 and this company goes bankrupt. This guy is sad because he has nothing still. How about this guy though? He's okay. He lost 100,000, that sucks. But he's still got another 4.9 million so we can keep investing in something else. They can't come after his stuff personally. They can only go after this entity, this corporation uh, that funded the mission, all right? So what impact do you think that's gonna have on investing? Am I gonna have more investors now or less? More, because they're safer, exactly. That's exactly, roughly speaking, what a corporation is now. So if you hear the title corporation, whether it's uh, an LLC, a limited liability uh, uh, corporation or company, um, whether it's a, a C corporation or an S corporation, these are the same thing. This is just usually for small businesses because uh, they tax you less. And this is for bigger businesses because they have much larger revenues. Those all protect you from being sued personally. So you could go out, start your business, um, screw up, your company gets sued, it can't pay it, so it declares bankruptcy, ceases to exist, but you know, as long as you have your stuff, you're okay. Could I just go make another corporation and do this all over again? I literally could, right? So that's what uh, corporations do. They add protection. So people, and people are plenty greedy, uh, and they'll come after your stuff, they can't sue you uh, directly. I should also mention too, it protects you two ways. Let's say they go to your actual house, and they drive in, and they walk out, and they slip on ice or something stupid, and they, and they break their neck, and they sue you, all right? They could go after your stuff because it happened on your property, you know, and it's your fault technically because uh, you didn't clean the ice or let them know or whatever the hell it is. But what, guess what they can't sue? They can't sue your corporation, right? So if you divide your stuff up, like you've got multiple corporations and you've got your stuff divided up, you are safe, man. Like, all right, yeah, they took a lot of my personal stuff, but who cares? I've still got like 10 corporations pumping me money uh, every week or month or whatever. All right, so this is how you can legally protect yourself, your money, uh, from being sued directly. And it's actually a very important uh, mechanism in our economy. The English, as far as I know, the English came up with it, uh, and uh, it's been used ever since. So if you're ever wondering what corporations are, why you would be in one, that's why. Uh, it protects you personally um, when you invest or start a company. Does that make sense? Yes. 
All right, so that means more people are willing to put money in, to buy land, to explore, uh, to bring more stuff back, uh, and that increases the amount of economic activity uh, and jobs, and that, that helps everybody else out by getting them more stuff, giving them more money, uh, and all of that. Any questions? Sweet, real quick. Remind me, uh, the technique they used to pool money to invest for things that were way too expensive for one person to afford by themselves. So if I want to fund an expedition or buy land, how did they do that? Joint stock. Joint stock, exactly. So I commit a percentage, and then I paid whatever percentage I put in. All right, cool. Um, but I am scared of being sued because of uh, something my company did and losing all of my stuff. What protects me from that nowadays, starting you know, in England a few hundred years ago? Corporations. Corporations, right. So what do they sue then if they wanna, if they wanna uh, get money for those crew members that died. Corporation. The corporation, right. And then my stuff is actually protected. Sweet. One of the major things that uh, greatly improves everyone's lives is the banking system. Now, banks get a bad rap, rightfully so, because they engage in some, especially now, some uh, gaming, greedy, unhelpful activity. But overall, they've drastically improved people's lives, and we'll talk about how. The first thing they do is they increase the uh, money supply for economies. And what I, all I mean by money supply is literally just all the people, like if this room is an economy, it's how much money we all have, all right? So think of it like this. If everybody here had $10, how much could we uh, buy and do? A lot, a little? If everybody had $10 only. You could buy very little, right? So for most of human history, certainly in Europe uh, at the time, there was almost no money. So there were, there were a couple people that were richer than others, but pretty much everybody, pretty much nobody had anything for the most part. So that means you can pretty much buy nothing. All right, so if you guys all had $10, uh, you would probably not just go right after class uh, and spend it all at, at Jack the Box, because that would be all you had. All right, you, you'd hold on to it. How can I get you to spend more money, though? Okay, incentives, but you need to have money to spend it, correct? Yes. If you had $200, if everybody had $200, is it more likely that some of you would go to Jack the Box after, uh, uh, for lunch or whatever? Yeah, because you got 200, you're not wasting all of your money in one single uh, meal, all right? When we increase the money supply, a lot of things happen, but the most simple thing that happens is people buy more stuff, obviously. It's, it's actually called the income effect. So if you have more money, yeah, you'll save more, but you're also gonna spend more. Like if I make $200,000 as opposed to making $20,000 as an adult, the $200,000 person's gonna spend a hell of a lot more money than the $20,000 person, because they can, all right? So one thing banks do is they increase the amount of money available. So when everyone has access to more money, they actually spend more, all right? Here, here's what, what I mean by that. Banks actually create money. And I don't mean like they print money and send it out there. I mean they create money through a, a phenomenon known as the uh, multiplier effect. So before I explain to you what that is, because this is actually gonna kind of blow your mind a little bit, I actually like doing this uh, example. Uh, before I explain this, one of the first banks to establish itself is one that wasn't risky, like, oh, hopefully I put my money in here and the bank doesn't go bankrupt and I lose everything, which could totally happen um, uh, <coughs> several hundred years ago. One of the first banks to establish itself is like, one that's been there for a while, knows what it's doing, is linked to the government, is dependable, I can get loans from, I can safely put my stuff in there, we can all use the bank notes for, for economic activity, uh, was the Bank of England. And that was established, I believe, in, eight, in 1600? Was that the exact year? No, 1690, it was on the jigsaw, wasn't it? Four? 1690s, we'll just say 1690s. That's when it's established. And you're like, okay, well, who the hell cares? Well, let me show you the multiplier effect. Banks actually create money. In fact, there's trillions of dollars in the world, like in people's bank accounts and stuff. Do you guys know, out of all those trillions of dollars that are in everybody's accounts and all of that, do you know how much of it actually exists in paper money? 10%? So you're saying 90% of money doesn't exist? You're not wrong. It's actually worse than that. Yeah. Of all the money that exists in the world in people's bank accounts, 
if I were to take all of it and pay you all out your money, I wouldn't be able to because the only amount of money that actually exists is about 3%. That's how much actual money there is in the world. But in our bank accounts, we've got 97% more. So this, this is a problem, obviously. If everybody went to the bank at the same time to pull their money out, what would happen? No. You wouldn't, only 3% of us would get our money or 3% of our money would be handed back out. So how the hell does this happen? Well, banks actually create money unintentionally. Now it's intentional, but it was unintentional before. And that's the multiplier effect. Let me, let me show you what I mean. Okay, so let's pretend this piece of paper is $100. It's a $100 bill. All right, so it's 100 bucks. All right, um, Jessica, what? Dang, what was it again? Aaliyah. Aaliyah? Okay, I'm still trying to remember his names. Okay, Aaliyah, 100 bucks. All right, you got $100. Okay, I'm the bank. She could just hold on to that money, uh, but if she's smart, she doesn't want it to like get stolen or lost or burnt or whatever, what's she gonna do with it? She's going to put it right in the bank, right? I'm going to spell your name right. So, you, I just looked too, I already forgot. That's right, yeah. There we go. Aaliyah, she starts a bank account, puts $100 in the bank, right? $100 in the bank. So now the money's in the bank, correct? Correct? Yes. Okay, cool. $100. Sweet, we're doing good. All right, let's pretend... Nicholas? Is Nick all right? Yeah. Okay. Nick wants to buy an expensive pair of shoes. He doesn't have $100. What could he do? Get a loan. Get a loan. All right, now bank normally going to give you a $100 loan, but let's just make it simple here. It's usually much larger amounts, but we want to keep it simple. So uh, here I am in the bank, and uh, I give him a $100 loan. So here you go. What's the problem now? There's no money in the bank if she comes to get it. Okay, that's a problem, but well, look, she's not necessarily gonna come in that day and come get it. So I give him the $100, all right? He goes and buys his shoes from, what was your name? Antonio. Antonio. He goes and buys shoes from Antonio. Congrats, Antonio. There's your $100, you get your shoes. What's Antonio gonna do with his money if he's a smart person? Put it in the bank. Put it in the bank, right, at least initially. Cool, so go ahead and do that, make a deposit. Ta-da! Now Antonio, oh, money fell, but it's still there. He's got $100 in his account. Wait a second. What's the problem here? I have Yeah, well, you both do, technically, and neither of you do at the same time. All right, because how much money is actually in the bank? How much? Well, I mean, not the percentage. I mean, like, if I'm the bank, $100, right? But how much exists on paper? 200, right. So this is how banks actually create money. And obviously you can tell this is just gonna keep going on and on and on. I could do it for each one of you. And then you take a loan and buy something from you and then MJ turns it in and then she's got $100 in the bank, right? And then the problem keeps on uh, resurfacing. So now you can kind of see why there's not enough money in the world because as long as banks are loaning money out and holding your money, they're creating money that doesn't actually exist, all right? But this is actually a good thing. Why is this actually a good thing? It's like I told you before. When are you more likely to spend money? When you have it, right? So if I'm creating money for everybody, and you all have money, you're gonna spend it, all right? That increases the amount of economic activity that's going on. So you buy more things. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's generally a good thing. It could be a bad thing if you buy too much and you don't have enough, you don't need it, whatever. But for the most part, it's good, because if I'm spending money, that means other people are earning money, right? So then they get it, and they can buy the things they need or open up new jobs for people who need money, right? And it, it's, it's, this, it's this kind of cascading effect where everyone's getting a little money, then they spend a little, then there's more stuff to buy uh, or make, so then they either make more stuff or hire more people, uh, establishing more jobs, so then you have money, so now you buy the things you need and the things you want, and it's this really big positive feedback loop of, getting money out in the economy so we can spend it, and then other people make money, and they spend it, and then people make money, they spend it, and that way we all get the stuff we need. That is literally why that new technology that makes this stuff super cheap, that is literally why we all have so much more than anyone else in history ever has. Here's an example. The poorest of the poor people 
in the United States and most of the world. Yeah, they have like almost no money, but guess what almost all of them do have? What's that? They do, yeah, they have those necessities for the most part, but even the poorest people have smartphones. Is that the same as uh, being poor without a smartphone? No, would you say it's better to be poor with a smartphone than poor without a smartphone? Yeah, because you, you can still talk to people, you can order things, you can find things out, you, you're connected to the world. It, it's a higher standard of living. So what this has done over time is it's taken even the lowest strata of, of economic um, uh, incomes, which, which is like zero. Like if you go out, most homeless people actually have a phone. All right, I, I don't know exactly how they get them, uh, but they, they have them, right? Because it's, it's, it's that easy to get it, um, either for free or cheap or, or whatever. Right, so even the poorest people still have access uh, to food and clothes uh, and phones and things like that. Something 100 years ago, there's no way you had those things if you were on the poorest threshold uh, of the economy. All right? So this actually does improve things over the long term. Uh, it kind of redefines what being poor means. Poor 100 years ago meant I have nothing and I might die next week. Being poor now, in the developed world anyway, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm doomed. All right? Like in the United States, we have a... We have more of a problem with people being overweight than underweight. In fact, I think that's most of the problem for the world now, certainly the developed countries. So it's sort of redefined what we know as being poor because uh, there's so much stuff available and there's so much money to get it uh, that um, it just kind of raised the standard for everybody else. I'm gonna ignore that because I don't care about it. So um, that's what banks have done for us, okay? So banks revolutionized the economy because they gave us all more money to buy stuff, so we do buy more things, and we make more things, and that makes it cheaper, uh, and it provides everybody with the stuff that they need to actually live. So this is drastically improved life, and there are definitely some bad things you can say about banks and overspending and being focused too much on making money and spending it, but at least we're not worried about dying each day in most of the world, certainly the developed part of the world uh, because of this. All right, so banks are what start that. And all these things put together, these uh, joint stock companies, uh, these corporations, all the money they use from banks or other uh, uh, funders or other individuals who loan the money, those are called venture capitalists, by the way. I think that might be on the notes. So that's like, instead of me getting a loan from a bank, I get it from one person who has a lot of money. Uh, like, hey, can you help me start this business? I'll give you a percentage if we do well, and they kind of say yes or no, and that's a venture capitalist. All of these things put together have allowed people to acquire uh, money, uh, and other capital to start businesses. And what I mean by capital is just anything that you own or use uh, to start and run your business. So for like that ship example we use with the joint stock company, the capital would be the money used to invest, uh, the supplies for the crew, paying for the crew, the ship itself, those are all uh, your capital. Uh, and that has drastically improved uh, people's livelihood. And again, I showed you that, I showed you the hockey stick graph yesterday, right? Yeah. yeah that is almost certainly uh, and almost solely because of these developments, that and the technology that goes along with it, that have really improved our lives, our incomes, our life expectancy, our population, all these things because it's made them uh, available to us. Uh, and these are the factors that ha have brought it about. And the reason why I tell you this is it's better to know why we have these things and how they've actually improved our lives uh, because nowadays it's very popular just to, to demonize all these things as being greedy or corrupt or terrible. And they do. They've got people and elements in them that are uh, definitely worth criticizing and fixing and amending and removing. Uh, but as a whole, it's generally helped pretty much everyone that's existed for the last few hundred years that's had access to it. All right. Uh, and that is uh, how we lay the groundwork for what we are known as our economy now, modern economics, which we'll talk about uh, next week. <clears throat> I think the only thing I forgot to mention was from yesterday is that all the people that use these things, joint stock, corporations, uh, uh, investment capital to start businesses and, and create money, uh, they actually created a brand new class of people. People that didn't exist before, because before we had king, noble, knights, peasants. We now have a new group of people that are super wealthy, business owners and whatnot, as, as rich as these guys, but they were born you know, potentially poor with no like noble title or anything. And that, because they got wedged in between here, is called the uh, middle class. So this started developing when these institutions developed. And again, those were just wealthy people who made their own fortunes by um, 
enclosing their land and farming it or, or paying for these companies to go out and start explorations or buy land or, or whatever. All right, so initially they were looked down upon because they weren't nobly born, but they were like, well, that's stupid because uh, we're obviously capable of making money and running companies. We should be involved uh, in the government as well, and that's more of a government topic we'll talk about in uh, March. But just know that these are the guys that invested, made the risks, made their own companies, made their own fortunes, uh, and showed the world, uh, yeah, it doesn't matter if I'm born here, 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 or here. I could potentially um, use these mechanisms to become wealthy and successful myself, all right? That's the, the middle class. That's what it was anyway. Now it's a little different, but that's what it was. All right. That's good enough. Let's get those two slides.